to, to everyone. Uh, uh, it's nice to see everyone here uh, in week eight. Hope everyone's studies are going well. Um, it's come to the end of term, so it's, uh, it's good that you, make the, you made the time to come to such a beneficial talk um, on, on the Quran and how we can build uh, our relationship with the Quran, especially at this stage of our life. Uh, I don't know how old some of you are. You know, I'm, I'm 21 years old. I don't know how maybe you're 18, 19, 20, maybe older uh, than that. Um, it says it's really time for us to try to strengthen, uh, strengthen our, uh, our bond uh, with, the, with the Kitab of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so I'll pass it over to, to our speaker today, um, who is who kindly uh, came, alhamdulillah, um, and he will advise us and try to help us. And hopefully we can go away and we can benefit from all that's been said. So we ask Allah to make this a, a gathering of benefit and us to implement all that we learned today. So Allah. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي وسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. الله سبحانه وتعالى هي سائز القرآن يا أيها الناس قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم وشفاء لما في الصدور وهدى ورحمة للمؤمنين. قل بفضل الله وبرحمته فبذلك فليفرحوا هو خير مما يجمعون الله جل وعلا he says يا أيها الناس O oh people قد جاءتكم موعظة من ربكم a heart hitting admonition and reminder has come from your Lord وشفاء لما في الصدور one that cures your insights it heals your heart Wahudan, it is a source of guidance. Warahmatun, it is a source of mercy. Lil mu'mineen for the believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, He is speaking to us about what book? The Quran. Then He says in the next verse, Qul, say, O Muhammad, bi fadlillahi wa bi rahmatihi, by the virtue of Allah and by the mercy of Allah. And the scholars of tafsir, the scholars who explain the Qur'an, they say that the virtue of Allah and the mercy of Allah here is the Qur'an. So it's as if he's saying, by the Qur'an, tell these people that they should rejoice over it. Be happy over it. Be satisfied with this Qur'an. What is the reason? Huwa, the Qur'an, khayrun min majma'un. The Qur'an is greater and better in the sight of Allah than everything you are gathering. Absolutely everything. You are gathering a family, metaphorically speaking. You are getting married so you can have children and you can have a family. The Quran is better than all of that. The Quran is better than your wife and the Quran is better than your husband and the Quran is better than your children and your parents, all of them put together. Why? Because these people in your life, although they are the closest, the nearest and dearest to you, these individuals, you have no guarantee, neither do they, that they will be misguided tomorrow. They may leave Islam. You and them may not be the same religion tomorrow. And even if Allah protects them from that, and Allah preserves their guidance and their iman, then they will definitely die. A universal concept agreed by every single man, every single woman, agreed by the pious, the sinners. Every single religion, wherever you go in the world, there is an agreement, a consensus, that every single person is going to die. And you look across the world today, and like the place we live in, in this country, they consider it, consider it to be a first world country. And they have reached in technology, and taqaddum, and advancement, and progression, things that other countries in the world have not reached but you still find death to be present in this country. Regardless of the advancement and the progression, because it's something that you cannot stop. <coughs> Meaning whatever progression happens, whatever advancement happens, they can't reach a level where they have progressed to stop death. Does that make sense? Rather you find the people passing away the majority of the time in the hospitals. The hospital is where you send this person to go to receive, receive treatment. But you find the majority of people not passing away at home. Where do they pass away? 
in the hospital. So Malakul Maut, the angel of death, he hangs around in the hospital, waiting to take their soul. To teach you something. That you are going to die. All Muslim, all Muslim, you now know that you are going to die. What is ahead of you from marahil and stages? Right? That's the purpose, no? Because with your passing away, it is not the end. It's not the end of your life. Rather, you are moving on to your eternal life. Your actual life. The place where Allah Jalla wa Ala He called you to, as mentioned in the Quran. Wallahu yad'u ila dari salam wa yahdi man yasha'u ila sirat al mustaqim. He says, Ila Allahi marji'ukum, and to Allah is their return. He says elsewhere, Thumma and thereafter, ilayhi towards Him, turja'un, they will be returned. So, wudu' means return. And in the Arabic language, you say, "Zahabtu ila al-jami'ah." I went to university, and then what would I say? "Warajatu ilan." Ila al-bayt. I went to university and I returned. I returned home. <laughs> but would you say the opposite? Would you say "Zahabtu ila al-jami'ah"? Would you say "Zahabtu ila al-bayt"? "Warajatu ila al-jami'ah"? Would you say that? You won't. You won't say I went home and I returned to university. You don't live there. You have a home, right? Unless when university. When it gets to exam season and it's like you live there, that's yeah. different. But during the year, you don't live here, you live at home. You say, Zahabtu ila al masjid, I went to the masjid to perform the prayer. Warajatu ila al bayt. Zahabtu ila al souq, I went to the market. Warajatu ila al bayt. Maybe, inshallah, if I come again, we can do an Arabic seminar. Right. You guys seem like when I speak about Arabic, you're all smiling, you love the language, inshallah. So Allah is saying, you'll be returned back to Him. And in Surah Al-Buruj, Allah says, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ And Allah is the one who often forgives. And wadud and, what does that mean? Uh, wadud is like caring. Caring, loving. And the scholars, they mention that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves when the servant has come back to Him. That's what it means. They stitch up the verses like that. Okay. We have just given a brief introduction to what we're going to be speaking about. After all of those descriptions, we have just given for the Quran. If we meet the average Muslim or Muslim and we ask them, this Quran, what is special about it? They have no answer. They say it's a special book. It's an amazing book. It's a blessed book. Okay, why? They don't know what to say. So I'd like to ask you all now and make an interaction and see what you have to say. <coughs> why is the Quran special? Why is the Quran amazing? If you have answers, raise your hands. Because in it there's guidance. Because in it there's guidance. Okay. Jameel, anybody else? It's the only book that has stayed relevant, or the only piece of article, or only piece of wording that has stayed relevant for 1400 years. It's the only article, only piece of text that has stayed relevant for 1400 years. Or has stayed, stayed untouched, or has stayed the same. It's the same. Jameel, anybody else? The sister. Why is the Quran special? It's your book. You have to have answers. Yep. It's the exact words of Allah. It's the exact words of Allah. Yep, I'm back. Because uh, the challenge was posed, if you don't believe uh, that this is the book of Allah, uh, make a verse like it and no one will be able to make a verse like it. Wow, your university is impressive. I'm from London and I go around the London University. I don't really come up north. I don't come this way. But when I do come, I ask the questions I ask over there. And the universities where I'm from, they don't really have much um, answers when I ask them. You guys, everything I wanted to mention, you guys mentioned it, basically. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the benefit of it. The scholars, they mentioned that the world is the garden of the believer. Is the what? The garden of the believer. And they say that if the believer, he comes with two things, he will reap the fruits of this garden in the hereafter. What are the two things? Does anybody know? What two things do you have to come with in this world for your garden, for you to have beautiful uh, tulips and beautiful flowers and etc. What do you have? What do you have to come with? Yeah. Faith. Faith. Okay. That's a given. Taqwa. Taqwa. That's a given. Is it intentions and actions? Intentions and actions. We're getting closer. The first one is beneficial Bene. knowledge. 
You have to have that. This is the only thing that the Prophet ﷺ was commanded by Allah in the Quran to ask him an increase of. In the Quran, you don't find Allah commanding his Prophet to ask him an increase of anything else apart from knowledge. And say, Oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Not increase me in wealth, increase me in family. You don't have any of that. You have what? Increase me in knowledge. And what does the knowledge have to be? Beneficial. Because you find sometimes Islamic knowledge even, not secular, not like university, even Islamic knowledge, sometimes not being beneficial. What's an example of Islamic knowledge not being beneficial? Slavery. Knowledge in slavery. Sorry? Um, the fiqh of slavery, you say. The fiqh of slavery? Yeah. No, it's, that's beneficial. There's no slaves now. Right. No one's enslaved anymore. But it's still beneficial to know how things work in history. Yeah. Things about the, like, say, things like about the unseen you're discussing that you're not sure about, and the un afterlife unseen you're talking about, like, life of the grave, or you're disputing something about it, and okay. it's not benefit. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Knowledge that's not beneficial is knowledge that does not lead to implementation. Okay. Even if you learn the Quran, you learn all of the ahadith, if you ask someone from the, off the cuff, you say, is learning the Quran beneficial? They'll say, of course it is. Learning ahadith is beneficial. You say, yeah. But it doesn't become beneficial to you. It becomes an issue, rather, if you don't implement it because it's going to come as a proof against you. Do you see? That's the second thing there. So the first thing was beneficial knowledge, and the second thing is righteous actions. If you come with these two things, the scholars say, in the hereafter, you're going to see the fruits of those two things that you came with in this world. So then a question comes. If we say beneficial knowledge, what is right at the top for beneficial knowledge? The knowledge of Allah. The knowledge of Allah. Via what source, what medium, what subject, what field? Through wahi. Through wahi. What is wahi? You don't know Arabic. Revelation. Revelation. What is revelation? Which revelation? The Quran and the Sunnah. The Quran and the Sunnah. Specifically, which one? What is the primary source? The Quran. The Quran and the Sunnah, both. You're right. But the primary one is the Quran. Is that clear, inshallah? Mm. The Quran. Okay. Now let's go through a number of things that makes the Quran special. Because that's the question I asked you. The first thing is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He placed a challenge against all of mankind. This is the Quran, it is from us. You don't believe in it, try to bring something like it. The challenge was placed. The first time the challenge came down, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he challenged them to bring 10 surahs, 10 chapters like it. Yalla, this is Allah's Quran, try to contend with it and bring something like it, bring 10 chapters. They weren't able to do so. <coughs> then Allah said, 10 is too much, bring one. They were unable to do that too. Then Allah said, Now we're just addressing <coughs> mankind. Mankind and jinn kind. All of you help each other. Bring something. Take the, take the jinn to be your allies. And with, e with each other's help, bring something like it. They were unable to do so. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He set down the final verse in respect to the verses of the challenge. All mentioned in the Quran. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبَدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِصُورَةٍ مِّن مِّثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا وَلَنْ تَفْعَلُوا فَاتَّقُوا النَّارِ وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Allah says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ If you are in a state of doubt, مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا Over that which we have sent down to our servants, Muhammad. I.e. the Quran. Fatu Allah is saying, bring forth the surah in Mithrihi. One chapter like it. Not only that, whether you shuhada akum, all those around you as well, seek their aid and assistance. Bring forth your witnesses. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are telling the truth. So what is Allah trying to say? You are not telling the truth, you are lying. This is our Quran. Don't even think about challenging it. Allah says, فَإِلَّمْ تَفْعَلُوا If you are unable to do that, Unable to challenge us. And you will never be able to challenge us. Allah says, Fear the fire. Fear the fire. It's fuel is men and stones. This fire has been prepared for the disbelievers. 
not only the disbelievers though, even those who have disbelieved in the Quran, those who have doubts with Allah's book, those who don't take the book seriously, Allah is saying, fear the fire, for verily, indeed, this fire, its fuel is people like yourself, people, anas, in the Arabic language is people, right? This is the first thing. By this, now you know that this book is from Allah the Almighty. Because until today, nobody has responded to the challenge. Nobody has watched. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this book remains unchanged. From the moment Allah sent it down to His Prophet, وسلم, until today, rather until the end of times. When do you appreciate this? You appreciate this when you look at comparative religions, you look at other religions, and you see how their books are always changing. Their scripture is inconsistent. The Quran, wherever you go in the world, whatever denomination or strands of Muslims you meet in the whole world, they have the same Quran. They present before you the same Quran. They may show you a 15 line one or a 13 line one. If it's a 15 line one, it's 600 pages. If it's 13 lines, it's how many pages? About 730. Same book though. Different font, different text. 13 lines, 15. It's the same. The context is the same though. Context and the content is the same. So this is the second thing. What is the second thing? The Quran remains unchanged. What was the first thing? Is there is a challenge to the people. Allah has placed a challenge to all of humanity. What's the second thing? It's unchanged. This Quran is unchanged. Okay, the third thing. This Quran has been memorized by millions. That's a miracle by itself. And from stats, from statistics, they say now, it's above 10 billion, not even billion, 10, 10 billion, they say. People have memorized it. And the majority of these people, they don't even understand the language. They don't speak Arabic to begin with. You, this one is a super, super important one. You think about it now. Are you able to even read a language that's alien to you, let alone memorize a sentence, let alone memorize an entire book in a language that you don't understand? The only way they have been able to do that is that this is not only another language, this is Allah Jalla wa Ala's words. And He has made it divinely easy from Him. So they are unable to bear the whole book. Pick up another book that's in Chinese or in Japanese or in any other, or Hebrew even, anything. Or Somali, anything, any language, any other language. Try to memorize it. You're given all the money in the world, you won't do it. You give up because it's hard. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you will give up. This one, it has ease connected with it. I myself memorized the book, I didn't know the language in the beginning. I found it very easy. And there's a lot of people here just like that as well. Why is that a miracle? Do you know why? When you look at comparative religion, do you know what their miracle is? If you find one person that memorized their book, that's the miracle for them. It's the opposite. Oh, one person memorized their Bible. Wow! That's their thing. But our thing is, our, our miracle we say is, we have millions of people doing it. Not a big deal. But the thing is, alhamdulillah, we found one person on the face of this earth who managed to do it. Alhamdulillah. That's, that's the difference. So we've mentioned three things so far. The first thing was what? The challenge. The second thing? Unchanged. The third thing? Memorize language. Okay, the fourth thing. We want to regularly <coughs> recap what we've memorized, taken today, so you guys can go away and retain it and, inshallah, ta'ala, share it with other people. The fourth thing is that this Quran it speaks about a variety of topics. And whatever it speaks about, it speaks the truth. Let's put this into perspective. You guys are all students at the university. You have different things that you study, you're on different courses. Say for example, a brother, he studies politics, or economics, or he studies medicine, or a sister, she studies nursing, or computer science, or engineering, etc. So that brother who studied economics, for example, if he tomorrow comes and he speaks about computer science, what's going to happen? He's going to make blunders, he's going to make mistakes. That's not his specialism. Make sense? Yeah. 
He's going to start talking. You're going to say it's better if you keep silent. <laughs> keep quiet. This is not your area of expertise, correct? The Quran it speaks about so many different things. Everything it speaks about it speaks the truth. And what's mind boggling for me in particular is this Quran was sent down on the Prophet 14 centuries ago. And he was in <coughs> Arabia. And the Prophet the scripture he came with, the Quran, he speaks about Allah. So for the man who received revelation to speak about Allah, who gave him the revelation, that makes sense. But he speaks about even observational matters, observational sciences, and whatever the Quran mentions, we see it in reality in front of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, وَالسَّمَاءَ بَنَيْنَاهَا بِأَيْدٍ وَإِنَّا لَمُوسِرُونَ and the universe will continue to expand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, وَالْجِبَالَ أَوْتَادًا And we have made the mountains pegs to keep the earth flat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the Quran, the sky and the earth, they were once one entity. فَفَتَقْنَاهُمَا We parted the two. That's why they parted. The sky is above and the earth is below. He says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ حَيٍّ أَفَلَا يُؤْمِنُونَ Indeed, we have made water the building block of life. It's a source of life, right? Water. Isn't that true? It is true. Of course it's true. And just to clarify, this book is not a book of science. As a Muslim, you don't believe that. It's a book of guidance and signs. That's what you say. It's not science. But the difference here is, the creator, he created all of these things, he's just telling us about it. So if it goes in line with what those people say, it's fine. Someone may say, no, but scientists, they talk about this stuff. What makes this one a miracle? You may say the other things I mentioned today, the challenge and the Quran being unchanged and memorized by millions, that's amazing. But someone may say the last point I'm mentioning now, scientists speak about it, so the Quran is not by itself in that regard. Other people have mentioned it, right? Who knows how to respond to that? Yeah. Science, uh, changes science, they change with science, they go back on themselves. Exactly. However, they, they always retract. They retract, they add, they change, they modify, they alter, they edit, they do all of that. The Quran, you can't even, you can't even, you can't change it. No one can change it. Even Allah won't change it now. Let alone people. Does that make sense? And these other people, they say stuff, sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong. Like the famous scientist, Aristotle. He says stuff, sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong. It's not a revelation. It's not from the sky. But the Quran, everything that it mentions is true and it talks about a variety of topics as if it's all one topic. That's, that's amazing as well. How many things have you mentioned so far? Four. Let's start from the beginning. What was the first one? Challenge. The challenge. The second one? Unchanged. Third one? Memorize the meaning. Fourth one? Mm, I said, don't call it a science book. Huh? I said it's a guidance in science. Book of guidance in science. Book of guidance in science. But how do we elaborate? Produces great in Islam. There you are. Yeah, go on. Finish. It's still not finished. I've all come true. Comma. Most of them have come true, but rather the predictions made in science are. But for example, in the Bible, in the Jehovah's mm -hmm. Witness, early 1977 was the Day of Judgment. So Say again. According to Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witness, 1977 was supposed to be the day of judgment. Really? I didn't even know that. Uh, yeah, I heard that. So, um, so you can say and argue that uh, when you look at other books, so some predictions have not come true. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, by the last point I mentioned, you realize that the faith that you have is a very tight faith. This faith has no gaps. Because Allah described this Quran to be tibyanan li kulli shayin. It speaks about absolutely everything. So you may come to a shaykh, a student of knowledge, a imam, so on and so forth, and ask him a question. He may not have the answer, but he will tell you, give me a day or two, I will come back to you with the answer. Where is he going to get it from? The Quran. Because of what I just mentioned. It speaks about everything. Just open the book, you'll find it. We've mentioned four things so far. Fifth one. This Quran, 
is a powerful, powerful cure for the diseases and the illnesses of the body and the diseases and the illnesses of the heart. They cure you from absolutely everything. And shall we give the story so we can put it into perspective? Okay. There was a brother. He proposed to his sister. It's not him. So if I point like that, don't be. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I just met you guys for the first time. <laughs> not knowing anything. <laughs> Maybe some of you are brother. I have no idea. No. A brother. It didn't even happen in this country. It happened in the, the Arab world. He proposed to his sister. When he proposed to the sister, the sister questioned. She said, "How is this man's prayer?" So they said, "He prays sometimes, and he leaves a prayer other times. He prays sometimes, and he." And he leaves the prayer other times. You guys are laughing. Have you heard the story? No, it's. Huh. What's happened? I, I, thought you, I thought you were trying to say that he proposed to his sister. <laughs> no. <laughs> Did anyone else understand it like that? Yeah. 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 Someone understood like that. No, no, his, his just, sister. Just to clarify. Just to clarify. <laughs> just, I just, just to clarify. 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 Just there's a long ayah in Surah Al-Nisha. It speaks about all the people you can't marry. Should I pause so Allah it? Allah begins by saying you can't marry your mom, you can't marry your sister, you can't marry your auntie. <laughs> so even if you like to consider your sister not allowed, <laughs> and your brother's not allowed as well, so the sister. He proposed to his sister. The sister questioned, how is this man's prayer? So it was said, this man prays sometimes, and other times he doesn't pray. So she said, I'm not interested. Simple as that. So this man, he, was, he wasn't a good person. He went to a magician and he tried to afflict this lady. He, you know, he got a bit too excited. He, he, he liked the sister a lot or something like that. Mm-hmm. He said, I have to do something. The only thing I can do is afflict her. He went to the magician. The magician, so these magicians, just for your information, they ask for certain information when they want to carry out their magic. So they will say, for example, this person you want us to afflict, what's their name? What's their mother's name? And provide us a picture of them. That's it. If they get that stuff, they, they can do their stuff. So we ask Allah to protect us all and our families from these things. <coughs> so he went to the magician. He asked for this information. He gave, he gave the information. The, the magician charged an amount. He gave the, the price, the amount to him. He said, come back tomorrow. I will give you the answer. The man came back the next day. The magician he said, I'm really sorry. I was unable to afflict that lady. He said, go to my colleague, magician B, magician number two, and ask him to try. He went to the next magician. The next magician said, firstly, I'm not like my other colleague. I am better than him. I am more well-versed and more skilled. So my rates are higher. So he said, oh, what's your rate? He said, this amount. He said, I'll pay, no problem. He paid, same information, mother's name, her name, picture. He said, come back the next day. He came back the next day. He said, I can't do it either. Then do you know what he said? He said, go to our sheikh, the biggest one. <laughs> the biggest magician. The one who taught all of us everything. <laughs> go to him. Obviously, he went there. The guy has guards, everything. Can, can I come by? I went to your students. They let him through. They went to the sheikh. Sheikh of magic. Oh, sheikh of magic. You have come to a picture woman. We need your help in doing this. Okay, he said, those guys were my students. My rates is going to cost you an arm and a leg. Great. He said, she's worth it. Come to the We'll pay what you want. <laughs> what do you need? I need her name, her mother's name, her father's name, her sibling's name. So he wants more important. And a picture. Basically, the whole family, everyone. And then he said, come back tomorrow. So he comes back the next day. What do you think happened? No. Mm-hmm. Drop it. Hard, <laughs> it didn't work again. He said, you couldn't afflict her. But this one, because he's very well versed, he gave him more info. He said, do you know what? Do you know what? He said, he said it would be more possible for you to go and touch the stars and come back down to earth than for us to afflict this lady. That's more possible for you to do. He said, you know the reason? He said, this, this lady, every single night, she recites Surah Al-Baqarah. So we cannot afflict her. 
we have tried everything. He doesn't mention it. And this is a commentary of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he says, Iqra'u Surah Al-Baqarah. Recite Surah Al-Baqarah. You guys know Surah Al-Baqarah, right? Have you seen how big it is? It's the biggest surah in the Quran. There's no, there's no doubt about that. It's very big. And this surah, the Prophet ﷺ says, if you read it, three things. The first thing is, it imports blessings into your life. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if you leave the reading of the surah, you will be remorseful and regretful. It's only going to damage you. And the last thing is, and this is what concerns us, he says, وَلَا تَسْتَطِيعُ هَلْبَطَلَ The magicians, they cannot overcome this surah. And that's what concerns us with the story we just mentioned. No magician can overcome this surah. And as mentioned in Sahih Ibn Hibban and elsewhere, they advise a person to read the surah every three days. If you read that every three days, generally speaking, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. No one can harm you. Confirmed. Double confirmed. Uh, you're okay. No issue. So we now know that the Quran is a powerful, powerful ruqya. Ruqya in the Arabic language is Islamic healing, basically. Islamic healing. You get that from the Quran. How many things have you mentioned? Five. What's the first one? Challenge. The challenge. The second one? Unchanged. The third one? No, 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 no. The fourth one? Uh, this fourth one is where the issue comes. <laughs> Let's stick to one thing. What did he say for the fourth one? How can we make it? Very simple. What did he say? Guidance of science. Guidance of science. But what was the main point what, that I mentioned about that? that is? Science changes. Okay. So the Quran will say, the Quran, it spoke about a lot of things, and the Quran speaks the truth. Mm. That's what we we'll say. And then the fifth one was? That the Quran is, is a healing. Okay. Mm. I can go on and on and on and on. And speaking about the Quran, we can't encompass everything in a lecture or two or a seminar or two or a course or two. Even if we sit here until the end of times, we won't be able to speak about the Quran from every single aspect and every single angle. We won't be able to. But these five things is what I wanted to share with you today in terms of the miracles of the Qur'an. So next time, when a person asks you that question that I ask you, why is the Qur'an so amazing? You have a lot of things to say. <coughs> like I said, but even more than that. But at least you as a Muslim, as a Muslim, you are proud. And you feel a sense of honor that you are able to articulate yourself when it comes to your own book. And you guys are studying in university, you have readings and etc. You are able to defend the position of a historian or a position of a Western scholar. But your own book, the author is Allah, and you are unable to defend it. Some of the scholars of the past, they will say, you should cry upon yourself. And this requires every single one of us, inshaAllah ta'ala, to give it a bit of thought. How genuine are we as Muslims to claim that we are practicing and know next to nothing about our own book? And the most humiliating thing, the most embarrassing thing, the saddest thing, is for the Muslim to be returned back to Allah in the next life. After reading so many books and novels, written by different authors, and they haven't read the book of Allah. And you go back to Allah like that. How is Allah going to view you, let alone how, how our creation going to be? How is Allah, what's Allah's perspective of you? Whomsoever takes the Quran seriously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes that person seriously. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nobody matters to him more than the people of the Quran. For the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam, he said to his sahaba one day, he said, Inna lillahi ahdina min nas Indeed, amongst all of mankind, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a family. So the sahaba, they said, we know from our creed, that Allah has no family, no one's attached to Allah. Allah doesn't have a spouse, nor does he have children, nor does he have parents. What do you mean family? Then he said, Ahlul Qur'an. The family and the people of the Qur'an, they are the family and the people of Allah. That's what we mean. That's what we're talking about. They took Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word seriously. So they became the closest to Allah from amongst humanity. They are those who are raised. They are those who lead the prayers. What is the greatest act of worship? The prayer, right? 
If a father and son are together, and the son has memorized the Quran and the father hasn't, is the father going to need to pray? No, he is not. The same thing for the sister, <coughs> the daughter, and the mother. Same thing. If the daughter is with her mother, and the daughter knows more Quran, she will lead and the mother will go back as a parent. Because these people, they take precedence in everything. The Prophet ﷺ, one time he came back from a ghazwa, from an Islamic expedition. And some of the Sahaba were martyred. They passed away. So they were going to be buried. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, even at the time of burial, bury the people of the Qur'an first. And you know when a person passes away, the deceased, the body, the only thing that the body desires is to be buried now. Because remaining outside, the dead body is, is something not good for the body. So the body desire. that's why they say rest in peace, because now it's peaceful. Does that make sense? Even at the time of burial, who is being given precedence? The people of the Quran. When they enter into that grave, a man will come into the grave, and he will say to the dead person in the grave, I am the Quran. I have come in the form of a man. You dedicated your whole life to me. I have come now to beautify your grave for you and make it from the gardens of Jannah for you. It's not Jannah yet, but we are doing this because you gave your life away to us. That's the Quran. They'll be resurrected on the Day of Judgment. Every single person will be resurrected on the Day of Judgment with three qualities. They will be barefoot with no shoes on. They will be naked with no clothes on. They will be uncircumcised, just like how Allah created everybody in the beginning. When you came out the stomach of your mothers, were you wearing clothes? Were you wearing that scarf? Yeah. Are you? Uh, you wearing it? Later. Were you wearing the veil? No. 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 <laughs> were you wearing your hijabs? No. To make it fair, you know, you say equality. If I just pick hair, then you see them. I have to do both sides, one on one. If I do two, someone will say you're not fair. But we're doing one each. Every single person that came out of the stomachs of their mothers, in those, with those qualities. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, we will return you back to that state. Allah will return everyone back to that state. So Aisha, Aisha is the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she said, oh Messenger of Allah, if the males and the females are all going to be together, and they're going to be like that, will they look at each other? And then she said, the affair on that day is more severe for them to pay attention to each other being naked. It's a day of judgment. It's the day of judgment. This is not no other gathering where you have gathered with your brothers and sisters in the mosque or in the mall or in the... You have been gathered to stand before Allah. Accountability is going to begin. You are going to see the one you have been worshipping for all of these years. He is going to speak to you and you have to answer to him. Jannah and Jahannam, your final abode is on the line. How can you look at somebody else? So the Prophet ﷺ responded, no, they won't do that. And even thinking about it now, it makes sense. Nobody will be doing that. You will not even have the mindsets of this world. You will have a different mindset built in. And what concerns you is that standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why did I mention all of that? The people of the Quran, they won't be in that state. They will not be naked. Allah is going to preserve their dignity and their honor. Clothes will come from Jannah. They will be made to wear those clothes. Not only that. A crown will come, will be placed on their heads. The Prophet ﷺ, says, this crown is more brighter than the sun. The sun. Is there anything even more brighter than the sun? The brightest thing that we have is the sun. The crown is more brighter than that. Not only that, the people of the Qur'an, their parents will be given that also. So the parents will be confused. As for the child, they understand. We are people of Quran, we get it. But if our parents were not people of Quran, for example, how did they get that? It will be said to them, Quran, Because your child took the Quran. And as the parents, we're going to honor you as well. There's also a point of reflection for us all. Our parents have done so much for us. Those of our parents who are alive, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to prolong their lives in obedience. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them all good health. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow them to be righteous servants of His. And those from our parents who have passed away, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to widen their grave. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make their abode Jannah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. The greatest repayment 
take this from me and don't, if you just remember this, as speakers sometimes you may hear speakers say things like this. If you just take this one thing before you go out the door, <laughs> hello, <laughs> hello, <laughs> hey. oh he's not going, he's sitting <laughs> somewhere else, oh you're about to go, he was about to go. <laughs> After he is, you can go. <laughs> the greatest form of repayment that you can do for your parents for everything they have done for you is Never, it's quite... learn the Quran now so on the day of judgment your parents can be kings and queens with those crowns on. For everything else you do for them now in this world, you're not going to help them permanently, you're going to help them temporarily. You are learning in university, you are studying here. First and foremost, to help yourself. But later, when you get a good career and good job, you're going to give them some of your wages, help them out, give them gifts. When you die, who's going to give them gifts? It's finished. It's done now. Even, even your qualifications, I, you're still studying, so I don't want to break your hearts. Your qualifications, the moment you die, is finished. I'm not going to go with you into your grave. No one's going to ask you about it in the day of judgment. It doesn't, it stops there. But inshallah, continue studying, don't drop out. <laughs> <laughs> but your parents, this is wallahi. I, if you have a Quran, I can swear in it if you want. This, there's no other repayment you can do than learn the Quran. You know what the scholars say in that narration I just mentioned? They say in this hadith, there's a glad tiding. What is a glad tiding? The individuals who are wearing those gowns, those types of clothing on that day, and the crown, then they won't go to the fire. They'll go straight to Jannah. The scholars they say, how is that possible? Because that's not mentioned in the actual narration. How do we derive that? They say, how is it possible that they have been given clothing that has come from Jannah? A crown that's more brighter than the sun. Then they are punished into the fire with all of that on. This doesn't even make sense. It doesn't make any sense. So in the hadith, the scholars of Islam, they say, there is a glad tiding. It is that they will be forgiven. And they will enter into Jannah. What happens next? When they enter into Jannah, the Qur'an guides them and takes them, transports them, navigates them to the highest level of Jannah. They will recite a verse of the Qur'an. With every verse that they recite, they will be elevated. They will recite again, they will be elevated. They will recite again, they will be elevated. Until they recite the whole thing, because they learned the whole thing. And then they will, they will arrive at the highest platform. The highest platform is where? Jannah to Firdaus. That's the highest place. No one else has been given this opportunity. It's possible if you're not a person of the Qur'an to get to Jannah to Firdaus. But what I'm saying is, now, by the Qur'an, you determine where you want to stop. Because you keep reading, you stop when you get tired. The more you know, if you know Juz'amma, Juz Tabarak, you stop at Juz'amma, Juz Tabarak in Jannah. If you know the whole Qur'an, you get to the highest place. Where the Prophet Sallallahu he said, إِذَا سَأَلْتُمُ اللَّهَ فَأَعْظِمُ الْمَسْأَلَةَ If you ask Allah, then greaten and strengthen in your request. You are speaking to Allah, who stands before a king and asks for a penny. You are standing before Allah, so ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for Jannah. What did he say, ask him for what? al firdaus Because he's able to do that. Allah is not stingy. Don't just make your dua so narrow. Don't make your dua so simple. Don't make it insignificant. Don't say, oh Allah, grant me Jannah. Say, oh Allah, you are able to do that. That's where you want me to be. I know that. Oh Allah, grant me Jannah to Firdaus, me and my family and my friends and my loved ones. And He will take you there. If you have the Quran, you will get there. The roof of Al Firdaus, do you know what that is? The throne of Allah. And Allah is above His throne. That's how close you have become to Allah. So when I say these things, I'm not saying it in vain. When I say the people of the Quran, they are the closest to Allah, literally is the case. Because now you are the closest in terms of distance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty. All of that you got from the Qur'an. Nothing else. If a person has the Qur'an, they will live the best life in this world. In society, people may see things. Society, due to times and evolving, what we, our society sees as something praiseworthy, people of the past didn't see it to be like that. And those who come after us will see differently. With every time, they see different. But with Allah, He's consistent. Those who have the best of lives are the people of the Qur'an. What's the evidence for that? Allah says in the Qur'an, we have divided all of mankind into two groups. You can leave now. <laughs> what is the point that we said? Learn Qur'an for your parents, especially if you do for your parents as well. Thank you for that.
Allah has divided all of mankind into two groups. He has said, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ شَرُّ الْبَرِيَّةِ Indeed, those who have disbelieved from the people of the book. And those who have come with polytheism. What's polytheism? More than huh? one God. Huh? More than one God. More than one God. Worship more than one God. These people, Ula'ika, these people whom they are, Sharrul Bariya, the worst of humanity. People who do something like that. The mountains are about to break break into crumbles and the mountains are about to turn into dust. The sky is about to split open. The earth is about to crack open. When they witness people doing that, this is the greatest sin that you can commit. The greatest sin in an Islam is this one, shirk. And it is the first prohibition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about in the Quran. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the first commandment in the Quran, when you open the Quran in order, Surah Al-Baqarah, the first commandment is establish your Lord's oneness. He created you from nothing. He created you. And you didn't ask, did you ask Allah, oh Allah created me? You didn't. Did you have a right to be created? No. Okay, after being created, have you given gratitude until today? You've given gratitude for a lot of things, no doubt. But who has given gratitude for existence? Not the money that they have, not the mother that they have, not the food that they are eating, for existing. If you didn't exist, nothing else after that would be working out for you. You can't be a Muslim if you don't exist. You can't study if you don't exist, etc., etc. He did all of that for you. So he's saying, my greatest right is that you single me out in worship. And the greatest crime is that you do the contrary to that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, these are the worst of people. Then he says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Indeed, those who have believed. وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And they have come with righteous action. أُولَٰئِكَ Those people whom they are. Khairul Bariyah, the best of humanity. So Alhamdulillah that we believe and we come with righteous actions, we are the best of believers. We are the best of humanity. We are the best of creation. But from amongst us are those who are better. He says, Khairukum, the best, absolute, the elite. From amongst you all is those who have learned the Quran and they teach it. And they are the best. Who is saying that? The Prophet Who is saying that? Allah. And nobody else matters. It doesn't matter. You could be who you like. You could, you could be saying what you want. If our Lord and our Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, are telling us that these are the best of people, then they are the best of people. Even if they have nothing else to their name. They don't have any other qualification. They, they don't have any other skill sets. They have the Quran. You have to remember that having their hearts as a repository for the Qur'an isn't a simple thing. Forget that. Do you think if Allah didn't make the Qur'an easy, you will, you will be able to listen to the Qur'an, let alone read it? You will die and you will be destroyed if you, if you try to do that. Because the creations around you that are more stronger than you, that happened to them. Allah said if we were to send down this Qur'an on top of a mountain, then the mountain would crumble into small pieces due to the weight and the magnitude of the Quran. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks revelation, then the angels, they drop down unconscious. Are you better than an angel? You are, we are all disobedient people. We sin by day and by night. The angel, they never sin. But they can't carry the magnitude of the Quran. They drop down unconscious. When they get up, they ask the other angels, what did Allah say? And if they said to them, Allah spoke the truth. That's it. They don't know exactly what does the verse say, and what surah. All of that is extra info. The fact of the matter is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is speaking. It's not like anybody else is speaking. And they have understood this. So give the Quran time. I'm sure I've bored all of you. You want to go, right? Go home. This was the worst lecture you've come to.
<laughs> Best lecture. London is a lot like uh, people from Coventry. Covents. What would you call it? Is there a name for it? I guess not. But the main thing is the Prophet ﷺ, he says, The best of speech is that which is short and concise. Like I said, we can continue and continue and continue. I have loads of points to mention. Loads of things I can share. But I want you to be able to go away and not need me or anybody else to come back and speak about this topic again. Not because you were given lack of info, but because it penetrated and it reached your heart. And now you understand the value of the book that you're giving me. Does that make sense? Sure. So should we carry on? You're meant to say stop or continue. That's the, this is where you, this is the time for your cues and when you have to speak. It's fine. Either way. Continue. How long has the talk been on so far? Like 35 minutes. 35 minutes? Yeah. 40 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. Okay, we'll take a break for two minutes and we'll continue. Sure. The categories, starting from the best one. So the best category to be from amongst are those who have memorized the Quran. Those who have learned the whole Quran. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, in a report authenticated from a group of scholars, that the one who has memorized the Quran and has taken it to heart, فَقَدْ اسْتَدْرَجَ النُّبُوَّةَ بَيْنَ كَتِفَيْهِ غَيْرَ أَنَّهُ لَا يُحَى إِلَيْهِ With him is prophethood. Except revelation hasn't come down to him and he's not a prophet. Because from our faith, from our creed, is that we believe that the Prophet وسلم, is the last prophet and no prophet will come after him. So what does it mean with him is prophethood? What that means is, what made Muhammad a prophet, which is the Quran, you have that as well. Because he became a prophet at what age? 40. 40. That's when the Quran came down. Before that, he wasn't a prophet. So with the revelation of the Quran, he became a prophet. You have what he had. So you're not a prophet though. That's the first thing. The second category is those who are on the path. And they are aiming to be from the first group, but they are not yet from the first group. They're now learning. They're studying. They're trying their hardest. They're making an effort. And remember, these, this thing doesn't come overnight. You can't be a half of the Quran, even in six months or a year. Well, you can. It's possible. If you write on YouTube, you'll even get results. But we're saying if you want to do it properly, if you want the Quran to remain with you, what comes quickly goes quickly. That's the point. If you do it in two months, crash course, in the summer holidays, it's possible if you dedicate 10 hours a day, 8 hours a day, 12 hours a day. But realistically, is the Quran going to remain with you? It's hard to say. It's, it's very unlikely. But the person who's making a regular effort, this is what matters. Yawm al-Qiyamah, you'll be asked not about the end result. You'll be asked about the effort that you came with. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu he says, مَنْ سِلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Whomsoever treads a path to acquire Islamic knowledge, then Allah makes easy for him or her a path to Jannah. Look, not acquiring the knowledge. Who treads a path? Begin it. It's not about learning it. It doesn't say in the hadith, memorize the whole Quran or memorize Bukhari and Muslim, memorize these books of hadith. It doesn't say that. It says, just tread the path. Come to the talk. Come to the class. Try your best. It's outside of what your norms, what you normally do. Break that. Bar stop that and, 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 and be someone who makes a change and you try like that. So you're on the path. This is the second group. The final group, and they are the lowest in terms of the virtue, but they still have virtue, is those who are not even trying to learn the Quran. However, they still have some sort of connection. They listen to it when they can. They read it when they can. So they're not actively learning but they have some sort of relationship, even if it's minimal. The issue is when you desert the Qur'an in totality. That's the problem. It brings a problem for your current life, and it brings a problem for your afterlife. Why is that the case? The Prophet ﷺ, he says, no prophet was sent to this earth, except they were given a miracle to prove their prophecy. 
Every single prophet that came, that was sent by Allah, they had a miracle, right? You guys know some? Like what? Which prophet and what miracle? Which, uh, with, uh, which prophet was that? In Arabic? Sadeh. What did he say? She. Is that what they say, yeah? In translation? I don't know. I didn't study Islam in English. So I struggle sometimes. I know English. Alhamdulillah. By the way, I'm not a freshie. I'm born in English. That's a clarifying Freshie. <laughs> for example, look, if you, if you were told now, you, uh, you study uh, academia, you study this, teach it in Arabic, you're going to struggle. Even if you know Arabic, you're still going to struggle because you didn't acquire the knowledge in that language to begin with. So it's different. I didn't study anything in English. I studied everything in Arabic. And I studied some things in my native language. So I didn't know about Sheath. I'm sorry about that. But Sheath is the Prophet Saleh. Okay, another Prophet and miracle. Who? Yeah. Jesus healing the lepers. Jesus. So Isa alayhi salam healing the. Jesus. Okay, try it. Arabic. You know, you don't know. Try it. Try it. He said never healing lepers. Yeah. People with leprosy. Yeah. People with leprosy with the skin disease, he will heal them. And Isa alayhi salam, he would bring things to life with the permission of Allah, as we like the Quran mentions. Any other prophets, miracles? Prophet no. Okay? Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, what was his miracle? Yeah. We need the Prophet and the miracle. Yeah, don't okay, need the Prophet. Moses and his staff. Musa alayhi salam. Try it, try it in Arabic if you can. Oh, Musa, Musa. Musa. Yeah. Musa alayhi salam. Sorry? They had multiple miracles. All of them had multiple miracles, yeah. but they had things that stuck out. So, so Musa alayhi salam. Yeah, so Musa alayhi salam, what did he do with the stuff? Split. Uh, and then what happened? It split into? Yeah. Into how many? How many? Two. فَانْفَجَرَتْ مِنْ هُدْنَةَ عَشْرَةَ عَيْنَةَ Twelve. Oh, okay. Twelve. That's what the Mufassirin they say. And each, each splitting, each, if you want to call it splitting, or each tide where the, where the waves went, then it quenched the thirst of a tribe from the tribes of Bani Israel because Musa alayhi salam was sent to what nation? Bani Israel, children of, the, children of Israel. So they had loads of tribes, each one was quenched, their thirst was quenched by what he did. And at the other time, what did he do? He, he did it with the stone, right? He placed his staff onto the stone. What happened after that? It turned into what? Snake. It turned into a snake. Allahu Akbar. A snake from a stone? Or water coming out of a rock? How is that possible? Allah is able to do all things. When Allah is involved, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make things that you can't fathom and understand possible. Okay, these are all examples. The Prophet sallallahu and his miracle was the Quran. He's saying, I hope by my miracle, I have the most followers on the day of judgment. This is the only hope I have. So isn't it sad that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi we are not aiding him we haven't made an intention to insert happiness into his heart on the day of judgment. That's all he wants back. He doesn't want anything else. He's not requesting for anything else. In the Quran, Allah mentions that that hope doesn't come true for him. And the majority of the people, they forsake the Quran and they abandon it and they neglect it. Allah mentions Surah Al Furqan. وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ And the Messenger said, Ya Rabbi, O oh my Lord, in the qawmi, indeed my people, my nation, ittakhadu, they took this Qur'an mahjura, as an abandoned thing. They never took it seriously. So be from the third group if you can't be from the first two. Listen to the Qur'an. Don't let a day go by except you have listened to the Qur'an. You have read a few verses. It's only going to help you and the day that you are going to have you're going to see the difference between the day that you have read the Qur'an and the day you didn't read the Qur'an. You're going to see your productivity change. You are going to feel the blessings with you. You are going to feel protected. And you find the other days when you don't have this. But you're struggling on that day. You're grumpy. Some, sometimes people have mood swings for no reason. They're sad. They're upset. They're angry. Or what's worse is they're inconsistent with how their, their behavior is, their temper. 
for example, they're with their friends in university, they're with their friends in other places, they are fine. They enter the house, subhanAllah, they have a frown. They're, they're not dealing with the, their, their family members in an appropriate way. You just left your friends and you were hugging them and you were saying bye. What changed? It is because these people, they are void. There's a void in their heart. They don't have the Quran with them. So they're struggling even with basic manners. So these three categories. What's the first category? To be from? Those who have memorized the Quran. Second category is what? Yeah. Those who are on the path. And, and the last category is? Listen to it. You have some connection. connection. You can't be from a fourth category. Because fourth category means you have no connection. Mm. You're not allowed to, to be like that. You're not allowed to be like that. You have to have the connection. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who give the Quran its importance. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to be from the people of the Quran. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his names and attributes that he blesses us and our families and our loved ones and those who are near to us, dear to us with these virtues that we have spoken about. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow this talk to be of benefit towards us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to implement everything we had. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reunite us all in the highest Jannah. Mm-hmm. Just like he has reunited us or united us here. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make every single person in this room from the carriers of the Qur'an, mm-hmm. the noble carriers of the Qur'an. Mm-hmm. I want to say one last thing, one sentence only. If you become from the people of the Qur'an, expect, expect blessings after blessings after blessings after blessings after blessings after blessings to come into your life. Expect it from now. You will see that firsthand, inshallah ta'ala. All it requires is for the brother or the sister to make the first step. The first step is the hardest one, especially if you haven't been doing it for a long time or if you've never done it before. The first step is the hardest. Should you begin? Should you take that first step and say, Bismillah, I'm going to start now. I'm going to start. And remember, think about this. I said one sentence, but I'm already on like five sentences. <laughs> Because when you're passionate, you keep going. This is the final thing. Remember, you have to be reflective individuals. Even those brothers that I teach in London, I tell them this all of the time. Be people who are reflective. Realization is different from understanding. Realization is a step above. You understand a concept, but when you realize things beyond that, so that maybe, they say, for example, look, is this all of your eye sock, for example? Is it all? No, no, no. Many definitely. brothers and sisters, right? They're not here. Okay. Allah blessed you to come to listen to this reminder. That's, there's a reason behind that. There's a significance behind that. It is because today is the day that you change. Today is the day that you begin your journeys. That's the reason. I have said it explicitly now. So no one has an excuse. I didn't even hide it from you. Allah's divine wisdom, you have to understand how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's qadr works. Allah allowed you to come here today to hear this. So that you may begin your journey. And the Prophet وسلم, he says, the one who Allah allows to benefit from reminders like this one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for that person. So glad tidings to all of you. Allah, your creator, he wants good for you. Inshallah, do we have an agreement? Do we have pledges and vows that we will begin our of the Quran, when are we going to begin, inshallah? Tonight, inshallah? Al-an. When? Tomorrow? Tonight. Al-an. You don't have to start this second or tonight. That's just a joke. But inshallah, begin. So what are the first steps you could take? Okay, go home tonight. Start thinking about this. Tomorrow, think about it. I need to sign up to a Quran school. I need to find a teacher. If you're a brother, you need to find a male teacher. If you're a sister, you need to find a female teacher. A place that you enroll onto. You learn. And just begin. And one last thing. I keep saying one last thing. Take the mic from me. <laughs> Allah says in the Quran, indeed we have made this Quran easy. Is there anybody who is going to start doing this? Fahal min muddakin. Is there anybody who's going to remember that? Is there anyone who's going to realize that? So the Quran is already easy. So do you know when someone starts a path and he says, okay, I started, they found it hard. It's not on Allah's regard, because Allah is already saying we have made it easy. It's on your side. Maybe your intentions are bad. 
You want to become a person of the Quran so you can be an Imam, like the brothers. So the brothers, they have it more. The sisters can be Imams too, but just for sisters. Sisters can't be Imams for brothers, you know. But the brothers, maybe, you know, someone may have an intention that I want to be an Imam so everyone can hear my voice. Everyone can hear my vocals, how I sound. That may, that may be the intention so they can record the Quran and put it on YouTube. I don't know, something like that. If you have that sort of ill intention, the path will be made difficult for you. But if your intentions are sincere and pure, you will see with every lesson you have, inshallah, that you're enjoying it. So it's not only easy, you're actually finding enjoyment from it. And you can't wait until the next class. Come. But inshallah, you guys are going to start, inshallah. I believe that you will start. I, I have no, when I am speaking with this passion, I may not see any of you again. I'm not even from the same city as you. And we ask Allah to allow us to meet, but we don't have a, we don't know if that's going to happen. So why am I pushing that as if I know, I don't even know what anyone's name, to be honest, except the brothers I just met here. And everyone else, I don't know who you are. But why am I saying that? I'm saying that as if I'm in my classroom, I'm teaching my students. Because I have seen firsthand the khair it has brought me. I have seen the change that it has brought to my life. I have seen the blessings in my life. And like I said, about blessings after that, I can see it, I see it, it's there. One after the other. And you come to a point of realization as well. That you attribute it back to the Quran. Because the worry is, if you get the blessings, you fail to attribute it to the right place. But you know that it has come from the Quran. So I invite all of you, inshallah ta'ala, to that as well. Any questions? Is to desert the Quran and for, forsake the Quran in terms of its recitation. You don't recite the Quran, you have forsaken it. The Prophet said that you used to recite it. And it's a commandment in the Quran that you recite the Quran. That's the first one. The second one is implementation of the Quran. If you forsake that, then the Quran may be a proof against you. The third one is to use the Quran as a healing and as something to take cure from. <coughs> if you don't turn to the Quran for cure and healing and you turn to medicine and you turn to hospitals and you turn to doctors, but you don't go to the Quran, there's an issue. And you are meant to turn to doctors and hospitals, by the way. And this is encouraged in our religion. Prophet ﷺ says, Tadawu ya ibadallah. Seek cure and healing from the right places. But you have to also remember the Quran as well. That's the third thing. The fourth thing is to use the Quran as a judge. There's an issue, there's a problem, you go back to the Quran, you use it as a judge. And the final thing is according to the Quran. They mentioned these five things. So if you sort out those five areas, you'll be okay, inshallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. That's in a nutshell. Another one? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's another question. Um, you said that the Quran has brought a lot of benefits to your life. Uh, how should our relation, you know, relationship be to extract those benefits? So what, what should we have? What skills or characteristics should we possess? To be from the people of the Qur'an, you need two things. Everything after that is a bonus. The first thing is, you read the Qur'an often, on a daily basis. Like I said earlier, don't let a day go by except you read the Qur'an. That's the first thing. The second thing is implementation. If you do those two things, you are from the people of the Qur'an. If you add to that, that's nurun ala nur. It's light upon light. 